let's get started. So, um, so since this is a deep learning course, I don't think I need to motivate the neural networks anymore. But generally, you know, uh, deep neural networks have been very successful in I mean, applications with different architectures like computerization, uh, bioinformatics, where we use uh, some graph neural networks for natural language processing, use RN. Uh, transformers uh, for fully connected networks. You may use uh, you may it's used for general feature based data, and we use uh, policy network, Q network for uh, reinforcement. All right. So today I'm going to talk about one particular use of uh, um, neural network. It's uh, representation learning. So here let me first give you an example uh, how we use neural network uh, to uh, learn a good representation. Okay. So this is a um, very uh, standard usage of uh, representation learning. So, so first, we try to learn a good representation. Okay. So by representation, I mean, so in this talk, at least, we mean uh, the representation is the second to the last layer, okay, which is here. So basically, you have some input image, and uh, you have a neural network, which maps um, this image to you know, go things through several layers, and you have the, to the second to the last layer. So now you have a vector here. So this vector, you can view it as a, a representation for this image, okay? And uh, this mapping or uh, this new network from here to here, you can call it um, feature extractor, which is uh, a, a map that, um, a, ma a function that maps the uh, image to a vector, okay? And the second to the last layer is uh, your uh, representation. So usually you will train this new network, um, this representation on a very large uh, data set. Okay, so here, this is maybe uh, even uh, four or five years ago, you just trained on image and now that you even train some on uh, some larger data set. Okay, so it basically you need to train on a very large data set in order to learn a good uh, feature extractor for the image. And the usage of this representation learning is to is that it is useful for the other task. Okay, so you may train this representation uh, on the image net, but um, this representation you learn is actually useful for many other tasks. For example, here uh, you have a new task. You may just keep those layers. Okay, keep those representation or this feature extractor, and then you just retrain the last linear layer. So this is one. Uh, use of representation. So you view this as a fixed feature extractor, and then you will train, say, uh, a support vector machine on top of the uh, learned representation. Okay, so this is how you use the learned representation for, say, a downstream task. So here, let me give you a more concrete example. Um, so here, let's say we train a representation function uh, with the architecture of ResNet, okay, and you train on ImageNet. So your target downstream task is a way to be called fusion learning task on say this VOC7 data set. Uh, so this is a, a fusion learning task in the sense that there are 20 classes, but there are only uh, one to eight per examples, uh, examples per class. So it's a, you know, you don't have real, very few shots per uh, class, okay? So if you don't use representation learning at all, you can use whatever method you want to use like SVM, hand class and features or neural networks, you can only get say 5% to 10% accuracy, okay? Remember you have a, this is a 20 class classification problem. So, you know, if you do random guess, the uh, accuracy will be 5%. So, you know, you, because you have very limited data, you cannot do much on um, this uh, very challenge, uh, you know, this few shot learning task. However, if you use the representation learning, so you first train this ResNet on ImageNet, and then you use this uh, feature vector, and then you just retrain the last linear layer. So you, this last linear layer just trained on this um, um, previously trained representation. You can directly boost the performance to 50% to 80%, okay? So you can see here, this is a huge improvement compared with the uh, results using representation learning. So this is uh, you know high level introduction of how we use the representation learning in practice. Although there are many uh, different variants of representation learning, I think, uh, uh, you know, later in the course, you will also learn them. All right, so this is for computation, but representation learning is a, you know, a general methodology also used in many other areas like natural language processing, uh, where roughly you can, for if you use RNN, you can view the hidden state as, um, you know, a representation for the sentence. And for graph neural network, you can view, you can learn a good representation for each node. And you can use this uh, representation for downstream, say, node classification and other tasks. Okay. 
So this talk, we have two parts. Uh, the first one, we will develop the um, theoretical foundation for representation learning. We study like under what kind of conditions that uh, representation learning actually probably improve the performance of the downstream path. So we study what are the necessary and sufficient conditions and we want to understand from a mathematical point of view why uh, representation learning actually helps. Okay, so this is a part one. Uh, so to motivate the second part, uh, let's again look at the recent uh, trend in representation learning. So nowadays, um, you know, this representation learning uh, model are becoming bigger and bigger. Okay, so you can see from this plot uh, from uh, 18 to 22, you know, the model size has been, uh, increased a lot. Okay, order of magnitude. And uh, also the data size uh, used for pre-training also increased a lot. You can see here this, you know, for language uh, applications, we use uh, 35 billion words to train a full representation. Okay. Uh, the main reason is that, you know, those data used for pre-training is kind of cheap. You know, for example, for language models, you just train them on using Wikipedia or those online articles where you can access them very easily. So it's, you know, data is pretty cheap for pre-training. Uh, so in, you know, generally speaking, for machine learning, you should use as much data as possible, right? So, and the, you know, those big companies, tech companies, Google, uh, Meta, they just you train the big models using, uh, you know, billions of uh, data. And you can see they uh, they actually improve a lot in terms of the performance as well. Um, however, on the other hand, uh, you know, most of people are not, you know, work for those uh, big tech companies. Um, especially for smaller labs or organizations, you don't have the resource to train those big models, right? For example, for this famous GPT-3 model, it has um, 175 billion parameters and use this number of data. And you know, we basically you need to train uh, on uh, 10,000 GPUs and there's some, some estimation for the total cost uh, is like 10 million. And generally, you, know, you don't have 10 million to train a single model, right? So in practice, uh, in many scenarios, especially for smaller organizations. So, and suppose you have some task that you don't, uh, you know, not language on vision, but some other tasks like say uh, biology or some other uh, practical uh, scenarios, you have limited resources, okay? Uh, say dollar GPUs, engineers, but you only have one or a few target downstream tasks. Say, I just want to improve the traffic uh, prediction. And uh, you still want to leverage all existing data from the um, from everywhere, from uh, you know, from all the cities. However, you don't have enough resource to actually train a big um, uh, representation learning or pre-trained model, just like GP3. Okay, so how do we do it? So second part of talk, uh, we will talk about uh, we re the recent uh, methodology we developed to actually to you know, actively select the most relevant pre-trained data. So the motivation is the following, you know, generally uh, you know, the resource you need to train these big models scale with the number of pre-trained data you use. Right? It's generally, if you have more data, you need more GPUs, more engineers for all the tasks uh, relevant uh, work you need to do. Uh, but here, if we can reduce the number of data for pre-training, uh, then we can actually you know, reduce the resource you need and another motivation is a recent finding uh, that, you know, it's not always that you have more data, you, it's always helpful. The data quality is more also very important. Okay, so you, you can, you know, carefully select the most important data for pre-training, which can already improve the performance a lot. Okay, so for the second part of the talk, we'll talk about our recent method of using active learning uh, to, you know, select the most relevant pre-training data. So you can reduce the data, number of data you need for pre-training and thus you reduce the resource you actually need for pre-training. So this is, a, you know, different from the classical active learning, which, you know, you only have one task, there's no pre-training and it's more like a supervised learning setting, but you select which data. But here we'll actually just select which uh, task. So we, I'll talk about what are the task means there and um, to select the most relevant task for the target task you really want. So, okay. And uh, I believe this is a relatively new area, like, you know, active learning has been studied for supervised learning, um, you know, extensively, but active learning for representation learning is still under four. So there are many uh, directions we can further study. Okay. All right, so this is the outline of uh, today's talk. Uh, we'll talk. First talk about the theoretical foundation of supervised multitask representation learning. 
and uh, there's a key notion that uh, you know, the main takeaway message about this uh, diverse, the definition of diversity over task which is very important for uh, you know, actually making the repair train um, to work. Okay, and then uh, if time you have time, I'll talk a little bit on the diversity localizer um, uh, in the end. So another part of talk, I talk about our active learning uh, multitask uh, work. Okay, so let's start from the supervised learning setting. All right, so here, uh, this is uh, you know previous task is problem. We will need some notations as a formal setup. So this is what we call supervised multitask representation learning. So let's say you have uh, in total T tasks for the source. Okay? So at the high level, we can also build multi-class classification. Uh, each class as one task as well. So we can you know, build them as a binary uh, classification problem, whether it is one class or not. So you know, just build them uh, each task as one class if you uh, are more familiar with um, uh, multi-class classification. So let's say we have in total T tasks. And let's say the inputs are say x1 to x15. So for representation learning, what you do is that you, for all these tasks, you want to learn a common representation, right? okay? Which uh, maps this input to uh, some uh, low, usually low dimensional vector. Okay? And I'll use this h to know the, this representation function. Okay? It maps the input to a low dimensional vector. And then for each task, you may have a different uh, predictor for uh, each task, usually it's just a linear task fire. Uh, so here let's say it's are G1 to G2. So during the training process, you will first you know, train all these tasks together. I will give you a formal uh, definition of how, what you mean by uh, uh, training all of them together. And then you, after training, you obtain this uh, learned shared representation function H. And then for the target task, you will uh, fix this H, okay? So now you just retrain the last, say, linear layer for the target task. Of course, in practice, you can also you know, uh, use this learn H as an initialization, and then you train uh, uh, all the, you uh, train this H and this F together for the target task. So you can also do it. But in this talk, for, uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, I'll just talk about the case that we only uh, fix this H and just retrain the last linear layer. Uh, although there's some recent work that extend our theory to the case that you can train uh, both uh, uh, um, this prediction layer and representation layer together in the uh, target task training phase. All right, so this is the high level of what is uh, done for all task representation learning. Here's a more formal mathematical uh, setup. Okay, so let's say in total you have P source tasks. Uh, let's say each have the N1 data points. Okay, so uh, you will have um, this number of these are the data sets. Okay, so here we will assume we call passive sampling from this data uh, or from this task, which means that you know each task we sample the equal number of uh, number of data. So later in active learning, we will say talk about actually if we uh, do some other form of sampling instead of using uniform overall task, we you know uh, select some tasks. We sometimes we select more, sometimes we select, select uh, sample less. Then we actually have a better performance. Yeah, so that's the second part of talk. And then, uh, so first you will learn using this data, you will learn a representation. So here, this is, uh, you know, we can view it as a bi-level optimization. So for the outside loop, outer loop, you will minimize with respect to uh, this representation function H, okay? So you can see here, this minimum minimization is outside uh, the sum. So it's setting on this H is a joint representation for all the tasks. And then for each task, you will learn a separate uh, classifier or linear predictor uh, for each task. They are different, okay? So that's a task specific one. So that's why, you know, for each task, you will have a, a different WT here. So WT here, here will focus on the uh, simple case that the predictor is just a linear. Of, of course, you can extend it to uh, more complicated linear uh, predictors as well. Okay, so here for the sake of simplicity, let's say the representation dimension is a small k, and uh, you after um, this representation mapping, you will just use a linear predictor to do the prediction. So this wt linear product between wt and hxit is your basically your prediction um, for this xit data. So i is uh, index for the um, uh, number of the data for the for the task, t's task. 
motif task. Okay, and why it is a label. Okay, so this is how you learn. Uh, the goal of this step is to learn this uh, H, okay, this is a good representation function. And um, the second phase, if you actually want to learn uh, uh, good uh, good predictor for the target task, okay? So let's say for the target task, you only have um, NT plus one number of data. So usually uh, NT plus one is much smaller than N1. Uh, for example, remember our few shell learning task uh, for the VOC7. Uh, N1 is like uh, 1,000. We have 1,000 uh, samples per class in the image net. But NT plus one, remember, is just like one to eight or, or a very small number. Okay, so that's usually the case for future learning. Okay. And for training, you just, you know, if you fix this H, okay, and you just train a linear predictor. So this is a very uh, classical uh, linear predictor learning uh, step. Okay, I hope uh, this is clear. Simon, I, I'm not sure if you could hear the question. Uh, not very clear. So basically the question is about like learning the H and W, are they being learned simultaneously? Um, or, um... Yeah, that's a good question. So um, for this step, they are learning simultaneously. So usually you just view them as a end-to-end -end training step. Uh, and you run say SGD to train W and H uh, together. Um, any other question? I think you're good. Okay. All right. So to develop the theory, uh, we'll first like Look at the, what the classical, uh, you know, standard uh, statistical learning says. Okay, in the supervised learning setting. Okay, so this is a quick review of uh, uh, classical statistical learning theory. So suppose we don't do any kind of representation learning, we just have a target task, and we have n t plus one uh, number of data for this task, and we learn this h uh, and w t plus one together. Because remember, this is our a predictor from the input x to the y, right? So we learn them together. So if you look at the classical um, uh, statistical learning theory, it tells you that you will get this kind of um, uh, loss, or you can call it risk, uh, for this uh, problem. So in the numerator, you have some uh, complexity measure of the uh, your predictor. Okay. So here, remember, we are training both h um, and w t plus one together. So uh, you will need some complexity measure to you know, measure how complex this uh, function is. So for H, you, for example, you can use some complexity measure like visit dimension, number of variables, uh, rather more complex than Gaussian width. So you know, in an abstract way, I will just write them as uh, CH. So that represents some complexity measure. And then you also have a linear predictor, which is WT plus one. And remember, we uh, assume that the representation dimension is K. So it will have um, you know, complex measure of k. Okay? And then in the denominator, you will have uh, nt plus one because in total you have this number of data. Okay? So for quadratic loss, you can get this very easily using a standard say, empirical risk minimization uh, type of analysis. This is what classical um, statistical learning theory says. If you only have one target task, you can do supervised learning. Okay. So uh, let's say what we need actually to prove that you, you know, for, uh, so our goal here is to show that if you use representation learning, you can get a better or like a smaller loss than what we can achieve here, okay? So here, remember, we have CH plus K divided by NT plus one. So the goal, you know, we, we see in practice that if you use pre-training, then, you know, your loss is smaller. So in theory, we can also want to prove something like a bond uh, that is actually smaller than this. And it also can illustrate why you know, representation learning can help. So that's our the goal of developing uh, such a theory. All right. So the so first assumption, you know, it, you know, we definitely need some additional assumption to characterize the uh, you know, connection between the source task and target task. You can think of uh, if there's no connection at all between the source and target task, you cannot hope this pre-training to help at all. 
So the first assumption, uh, which is very natural assumption, and this, you know, uh, if you don't have this assumption, you should not use uh, representation learning in the first place, is that uh, so this assumption states that there exists a good representation. Okay, this is just an existing result, uh, existing assumption. There exists a good representation such that uh, on both the source and the target task, the loss is very small. Okay, so formally, we assume that. Uh, there's some h star in big H. Remember, big H is our uh, function class for the representation. Okay, such that uh, if you consider this h star x uh, will be uh, in R k, and also we have set up for good linear predictors, let's say w one star to w t plus one star, uh, which is also in R k, such that uh, our prediction, remember, is the inner product between w's and um, h of uh, x. So if we consider those optimal ones, which is H star and uh, W star, um, then we can have zero loss here for both the uh, training as far as both for the source and target loss. So here we assume the loss is zero just for simplicity. You can also generalize to say a very small loss, say epsilon or something like that. Okay. So that's the first assumption. Okay. Basically it assumes that uh, there exists a good, a common uh, good representation. So, uh, you know, this is very important. This is a shared good representation. Okay. And that's, you know, kind of a characterized one connection among this task because they do have some similarity in terms of that they exist, there exists a good representation such that they can achieve a small loss. Okay. Um, you know, this is, uh, if you don't believe this is true, you should not use representation learning in the first place because, uh, you know, you, you just, our algorithm basically relies on this um, assumption that uh, we fix this H in the second phase. If you don't believe this is true, is there no even exist um, uh, a good representation that you should not use this uh, uh, representation learning at all. Okay, so this is the first assumption. So the first question you may ask, okay, now we have this assumption. Now, based on this assumption, can we show some uh, circle results showing you know, using representation learning is probably uh, better than you, uh, without using representation learning, right? Okay. So now let me give you a high level intuition why this existence of a good representation is not enough. Okay. So this is an um, um, uh, intuitive example. So suppose your source task, you remember how T source task is about classifying uh, the types of uh, the cats. Okay, so you have different types of cats, you want to classify them. However, your target task um, is to classify whether an image is a cat or a dog. Okay? So intuitively, um, you cannot do well for the target task. Uh, the reason is that uh, although there may exist one good representation that is con you know, shared good representation that is good for both uh, cats and dogs, there might exist one. However, when you're actually learning the school representation, you only have information about the cats, right? This is what the source has provided. You. you don't have any information about dog. So you may have, uh, you know, there may, there can be a good representation for both cats and dog, but the, because your source has, does not have uh, any information about the dog, the learned representation may not have uh, it's not a good representation for classifying uh, whether it's a dog or not. Okay. So this shows, you know, we, uh, the existence of a good representation is not uh, enough. So here, let me give you, you a more uh, formal uh, example. Okay. So let's say your input uh, is, let's say, 1,001 vectors, okay, like this. Then a good representation, uh, the underlying good representation, is the first 100 dimension. Okay. So all the tasks. Uh, including the source and target task, only need the first 100 digits to uh, accurately uh, predict the label. Okay, for example, the task can be you know, predicting whether the tenth label is one, predicting the sum of the first 100 digits, etc. Okay, so if you consider this the following scenario, the source task only need to use the first 50 digits. Okay, whether for them predicting whether tenth digits is one, the sum of uh, first 50 digits, something like that. However, the Target task you need to use all the first 100 digits. Okay, so for example, you want to predict the sum of the first 100 digits. Okay, however, the source task cannot give the full information about what is uh, actually a good representation, right? Because it only uses the first 50 digits, the from the 51s to the 100s, 
you don't have information from the source task. And you, you, know, you may think of uh, you know, those 50 digits are not useful anyway. However, if the target task actually relies on you know, those 50, 51st to uh, 51st to the 100th digits, then actually uh, the learn from potential learn from the first, uh, from the source task are not uh, very useful. Okay? So that's the intuition. Uh, so actually you need some more information beyond uh, just the first three digits in the sense that the source act, you want pre-training to succeed, you need the source act to give the full information about uh, the good representation. So that's the idea. Uh, so later we'll see that this kind of bad scenario in the, uh, is kind of the worst case target task. And when you do active learning, actually, if you have some benign case target task, you can actually do better. You may have a better, uh, you don't really need the full information, but you need some more uh, fine grained information uh, for the specific target task. So this is mainly for if you want to have this kind of worst case target task, you do need to provide free information about the representation. All right. So, uh, what is the you know, definition of the full information? Okay. So, this comes, uh, I think, is the main contribution of this uh, of our work is that we give this formal definition of the diversity of uh, the source type. Okay. So, you remember from the previous uh, two examples, we need this uh, source task to give the full information about representation. In the sense that you need to be diverse enough to cover the entire uh, representation, right? So you need this kind of diversity uh, condition. Okay, so what is the formal definition of the diversity? Okay, so remember this is uh, just a reminder of the, this is the formulation. We have uh, you know, a key task from uh, maps to the H. And then we have uh, some common representation here. And for different source we have different predictors. All right. So here's uh, the diversity for linear predictors. Suppose the second layer, uh, the, the predictors are just linear layers. So those are W1 to W2 plus one. So this is our first assumption. We need to have a common good representation, right? We have some H star and this uh, W stars. That's how the um, composition is. Uh, a good uh, it's a good predictor for both the source and target task. So this is our key definition. So basically, uh, qualitatively, we need this W star matrix, which is a concatenation of all these linear predictors. So it's w from W1 star to WT star from the source task. So remember, each uh, vector is a k-dimensional vector. And in, uh, if you concat them together, it's a k by t uh, dimensional uh, matrix. So we assume, oh, this, is, this assumption states that this matrix is a full rank, okay? Uh, or basically we need to assume the rank is K, okay? So basically implicitly we require P is at least um, uh, as big as K, okay? So why is it called diversity? If we have a full rank matrix, it says that these vectors, these key vectors, cover the entire uh, linear space of uh, this K dimensional, uh, vector space, right? It covers the entire k-dimensional vector space. And uh, it's the full end and it does cover the entire space. So that's why it's diverse enough such that it is, um, it covers the entire space. That's why we call it diversity. Okay. So I now, uh, good question. Yeah. What if your W star T plus one falls in the convex hull of... Um, yeah, w that's a great question. Actually, we are, basically try to utilize that property for the active learning task. So this one is for the worst case uh, target task. Okay, so worst case target task means it can be any in any uh, direction of this k-dimensional space, right? Uh, that's where, you know, this are a k-dimensional vector lies in. Uh, so in the worst case, you need, still need to, you know, you need to cover the entire space. Otherwise you can, you know, set WT plus one to be something that's orthogonal to uh, this type of stuff. But you are right that uh, if we have some stronger condition that this W T plus one star is in the um, space spanned by uh, these vectors, you can actually you don't really need, the, need this assumption. Uh, actually, we are using that for the active to develop our active learning um, uh, algorithm. Yes. Yeah. Any other question? I right. see a question um, from the class, but there, there's a question from a virtual audience. Uh, okay. 
asking, are there any further assumptions on the loss function? For example, the assumed. Oh, net. that's a great question. So, um, so here, let's say the loss is quadratic. Um, and it also works for, um, if at time also have our some recent result that uh, it also works for say cross entropy loss. Yeah. All right, so now let's first look at uh, some uh, examples. I mean, there are a couple of uh, questions uh, right now, so please go ahead. Well, how do you practically figure out if like the problems that you're trying to find have a good representation or that you're even learning the right properties of the tasks that you're trying to then like, so did you uh, hear the question? Uh, not really. <laughs> Basically, the, the, the question is how, in practice, how we can um, basically figure out if I understand the question correctly, like these assumptions, you know, hold and we are learning proper representations. So yeah, that's a good question. So in general, we cannot verify, you know, because this is depend on some unknown parameters. Uh, but um, of course, you can do a you know, kind of um, uh, check after you train. Uh, so after you do pre-training, you can check the learn W uh, such as whether it's a full end or not. You can some, do something like that. Great. There's one more question. Please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. So when you have more than one uh, source tasks, what goes wrong when you choose uh, the one source task that's the closest to your target and train entirely on that task and nothing else. Why do you need diversity with more than one sources? So you mean you have one source um, that is, um, say, uh, close or even equal to the target task, and you are asking what's wrong with uh, that case? Is that what you're asking? The maximum on the closest task to the target. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you on the last sentence. On the, the closest task to the target instead of the whole set. I mean, it depends on how close it is, right? So if it's still far from the closest one, maybe it's still far from the target. So let's say uh, in the example I said, um, you have a target task, it's kind of orthogonal. So suppose you don't have diversity assumption, but there's a target task that is whose uh, linear predictor is uh, orthogonal to all the source tasks. Then basically you have no hope to uh, do well on the, this target task, using pre training. Good. One last question on Zoom. Um, the question is, should we enforce some relationship between different tasks in form of W so that they learn orthogonal information? Uh, you mean algorithmically? Um, yeah, I mean, you can. So actually in our, uh, one of our recent work, we actually developed some uh, method to encourage this kind of diversity and uh, show some promising results. So ultimately, yes, uh, you can change the training step uh, or basically you add some regularizer to encourage some diversity of the learned uh, representation, learned uh, Ws. All right, if no more question, uh, I'll continue. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, asking these questions. They are all great questions. So let's first look at a very simple example, okay? Uh, so that's what we call linear representation. So this is not an entirely new um, model. It's actually uh, studied uh, by several papers in uh, around 10 years ago, where they call the subspace learning, multitask subspace learning. So here, basically, you can view the representation as a matrix, okay? It's a, a matrix of size k by d, where the input is d. You can think of a d is very, very large. But the representation um, dimension is k, which is usually much smaller than d. Okay. This is what we call the linear representation class. Or basically, equivalently, you can say we want to learn a k-dimensional subspace that is a good representation of the original d-dimensional um, you know, uh, raw input. Okay. So now uh, let's first state this uh, assumption. The first assumption will become um, uh, there exists some representation that's called B star, um, uh, which is a matrix of dimension K by D. And again, this set of um, uh, W stars, such that you know, the composition of B star and the Ws uh, have low loss okay? for all the tasks, including the source and target task. Okay. So here the representation uh, operation is just you know a matrix multiplication. So you just multiply B star on the uh, the input, just and the result will be the representation. 
All right, so the theorem we have for this very simple case is boring. Um, so we show that under these two assumptions, uh, we can have these laws to be of um, this order, okay? So it depends on several um, uh, parameter, okay? So first depends on uh, in the numerator. So let's first look at the first term. Um, the first term is the numerator has dk. So this is basically the size of this uh, representation matrix, right? This piece has the size of kd. So in general, it's quadratic complexity of um, this representation. So the more interesting part is the uh, denominator in the first term is n1 times the least single volume of the uh, w star matrix. Remember, we assume w star is full rank, so it definitely the least single volume will be a positive. And you can see here, it actually depends on this least single value in this um, uh, quantitative way. Okay, so, so let's discuss what are the, you know, how this uh, thing called value can be. So let's consider in the best case, okay, in some B9 case, this singular value can be as large as uh, square root of T over K. So in the case that you have, uh, so for normalization purpose, I say each uh, WT, uh, has norm one. So in total, this matrix will have for Green's norm uh, T. And uh, if the, you know, the condition number is very small, and then you will have this least single value to be um, P or uh, square root of P or K. So if you're plugging back in the denominator, you will have N one times T, and the numerator will be say DK squared, something like that. Okay. So that's for the linear setting. Um, in the in some B9 case, of course, uh, as I talk about, if this single value uh, goes to zero and there's some target task that is orthogonal to the, all the W stars, uh, the space spanned by this W star, big W star, then actually you cannot get a good uh, loss. And that is indeed true if you, in practice as well. You, have, you can verify in simulation that uh, now you cannot really learn good representation for those cases. All right, so without representation learning, uh, if you use, just use the, um, you know, NT plus one data to learn the linear predictor, remember the optimal predictor is still a linear one, you will get this kind of D over NT plus one kind of uh, loss rate, okay? So if you compare these two, they compare with the nine case, uh, for the second term, which is what we use to learn this uh, small dimension linear predictor. So the second term is always more than uh, this term, right? Because KH mass more than D. And for the first case, if your N1 is much larger and your T is generally large, say bigger than um, uh, K squared, then uh, the first term is still much smaller than um, this term. Okay. So in, together, this term, if under these conditions, we show that uh, for this linear subspace learning problem, uh, you can actually achieve a much smaller rate, uh, uh, loss rate for, um, for, for this task compared with the supervised learning. Okay, so this shows um, these two assumptions are sufficient to enable uh, pre-training to actually uh, improve the downstream task performance. All right, so this is for subspace uh, learning. Uh, we also have a more general result uh, for can general. You, can yeah. I interrupt you uh, real quick? So yeah. uh, very interesting result. Um, so it was basically thinking what happens because in, in representation learning, we kind of have more data, right? So we have yeah. all of you know, T tasks that we are basically learning. Yeah, yeah. So in total, you will have uh, N1 T data in school training. Yes. Right. So what would happen if we have either, roughly speaking, basically what, what would happen if you use, like without like learning, you know, representations and like learning the last layer for the target, what would happen if we learn everything together? Basically with the same number of data points, um, how the loss function on one particular target um, task would compare with what we, we what we get, you know, with representation learning. Um, do you mean uh, for target task? We also have this number of data, or because uh, another uh, basically um, way that I can learn my target is that suppose I have these T tasks in my training, and yes. I'm just gonna basically retrain everything from scratch. Right, so I'll add this target task to my Batch and I'll basically return. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So, okay, so here, first, the setting is uh, we have uh, for target has, that's what we really care about. We're going to have NP plus one data. And uh, uh, so, usually we assume NP plus one is much more than one. But if in the case if we just care about multitask learning instead of, uh, you know, um, 
we just care about performance in those uh, source tasks, then you basically just replace this NT plus one by N one. So that's the risk for the source tasks uh, as well. So you still have, you still benefit from this uh, joint training because otherwise it will be N one, uh, it still be like N, a D over N one. Okay, so you do not benefit the denominator of uh, the T in the denominator. I see, thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, in the proof, we kind of uh, use first prove the risk for the source up, and then we do some uh, analysis to transfer it to the target task. So yeah, so these are kind of very related. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, let me present the next result. This is a more general result uh, for general representation function. Okay. Um, so again, remember the assumption is that now we have a general function, uh, a, a general function class H, and we have some uh, H star, which is a common Boolean representation for all the tasks. So here, uh, the denominator is the same, but the, just the uh, uh, numerator, you'll just change it to some complex measure of this uh, function class. So here we can say it's the Gaussian width of the representation function class. So with Gaussian width, you can actually prove for a certain, say, norm bounded uh, neural networks, you can plug in existing analysis, especially recent analysis for neural networks to bound the Gaussian width of those uh, the, uh, norm bounded uh, neural networks as well. Okay, so this is a more general result and applies to a certain type of neural networks. If you have a, a good bound of Gaussian width or other complex measure for neural networks as well. Okay, so that's our main results. Um, and you can see here, uh, you will compare with the naive case. We remember uh, we have uh, for general function, you will have NT plus one in the numerator, but the denominator, uh, sorry, in the denominator and the numerator, you will have CH plus K. So again, this is in the benign case that this leasing of value is very uh, big, then you still have benefit from uh, pre-training compared with uh, uh, standard surprise learning. All right, so here let me briefly talk about why uh, your representation learning calls. So, so some uh, intuition behind, uh, in the proof, okay? So the key thing, it lies in this uh, joint optimization of uh, representation and prediction. So remember, we are actually trying to, you know, in the minimization uh, step, we are trying to find H that is commonly good for all the source tasks, right? So you remember this is a minimization problem and optimization on representation is over all the tasks, okay? So, so from, this, from the optimality condition, you know, we must find a shared good representation for all tasks. Otherwise, the loss cannot be actually be small, right? Uh, you will find some better ones uh, that is even smaller than um, the one you find. So because of this joint training, you can actually find a good representation for all the tasks. Okay, so that's the main intuition uh, behind this representation learning that makes representation learning actually worse. The joint optimization forces you to learn a uh, good representation. Okay, so that's the kind of intuition. Uh, yeah, yeah, so if you're interested in the details, you check our paper. So the key takeaway uh, from the first uh, um, uh, from the first part is that the existence of good representation and the, importantly, the diversity of the tasks are the key condition that enables the representation learning uh, to improve the sample efficiency. Okay. So uh, for now, I don't have time to talk about diversity regularizer, but uh, you have time in the end, I will talk about our recent work on how to actually, you know, as a regularizer to improve diversity, which is uh, uh, useful in practice as well. Okay, so now let's talk about the second part, uh, which is uh, active multitask representation learning. So, you know, um, uh, there are the questions asking about, you know, if there are some sort of target tasks uh, the targets are as you know very relevant to some particular source task, and actually can you don't need this uh, diversity assumption, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, and we are utilizing that to develop this uh, active learning uh, algorithm. So first, we need to a uh, more fine-grained uh, uh, the definition of uh, what is the task relevance. Okay, so remember our diversity assumption is for the worst case. Uh, target task. But if this target task actually have some is relevant to a one or a few particular uh, source tasks, then you don't really need this uh, diverse uh, source task. Okay. And the general goal of active learning is to select the most relevant source task to the target task. If you have some information about target task. Okay. So the first question is a definition question. Uh, how do we actually characterize relevance? 
Uh, so again, let's look at this example again. Uh, we have uh, 1,000 dimension input of zero one vector and the good representation is the first 100 dimension. Okay? Remember the bad scenario is that uh, source task only use the first 50 digits, but target task will require 100 digits. That kind of the worst case target task uh, for this kind of source task. However, uh, if the target task also only uses the first 50 digits, although your say your dimension of the repetition is still 100 dimension, but if your target task only uses the first 50 digits, you can still learn good representation for this particular target task. So here, you know, uh, this target task is not the worst case target task. It is uh, still good uh, with respect to this kind of source task. Okay, so this is not the worst case source task. Uh, and also notice that uh, you know for this kind of scenario, uh, you know you have some redundancy in the representation because here in, indeed you only need fifty digits. Although you know in the worst case you need one hundred digits. All right. So now let's give you uh, let me give you a definition of, uh, of task relevance. Okay. So again, we will need this assumption that existence of good representation, uh, some h star and double one star to double t plus one star. So here's our definition of the task relevance. Um, so here, remember, uh, so here, uh, we call here, we don't assume any uh, kind of diversity, but still we need to assume that WT plus one star lies in the span of this uh, W star. Otherwise, uh, again, like what I have talked about, if WT plus one star is orthogonal to W star, you can basically cannot hope, uh, you know, learn representation is helpful for the target task. So you still need this um, assumption that the double star, the double T plus one star is in the span of this double star, okay? And then there might be multiple, you know, so now you can represent double T plus one star using the vectors in double star, right? Because uh, it's a nice in the span, it's a linear combination. So there might be multiple, uh, you know, way of, uh, you know, uh, 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 representing this double T plus one star using say double one star to double T star. So here we consider the one that minimizes the uh, L2 norm. Okay. So here, let's say uh, there, you know, there always since this double T plus one star lies in the span of double star, there always exists some vector, let's say nu. Okay. So that's that double star times nu equals double T plus one star. This is the by definition of the uh, linear span. Okay. And then we define this task relevance uh, as the uh, the one of this new is that it has a minimum L2 norm. Okay, so here we use L2 norm, but um, you know, uh, this norm, uh, the dependence on norm is kind of arbitrary. You can also use other norm, okay? But now if you use this norm, it uniquely defines um, uh, a vector, a t-dimensional vector, new, such that uh, you can represent W T plus one star using W star, okay? So there's a minimized norm in order to have a unique new star. And so let's look at the one particular example. So suppose uh, each WT star is one, okay? So the new star can be as small as one over T, okay? In the case that all the say, tasks are the, are the same and they are equal to the uh, source task, okay? And in the worst case, it can be as large as one or sigma mean uh, the least single value uh, of W star uh, square, okay? So uh, there's also some other cases, a new star equals one, which is the case that one source task equals to target task, and the others are orthogonal, okay? So in that case, basically there's, uh, there's a unique uh, W star, WT star equals to WT plus one star, and the others are zero. So that's the case for, uh, for, for this scenario, okay? So this is a well-defined notion for task relevance. So actually, based on this notion, we can actually improve the original theorem, which is some, uh, we can also rewrite the original bound as this one. So actually, instead of depending on the least single value for the worst case cost, but if you have one particular uh, target task, you can also rewrite the theorem in this way, which is dk times uh, new star norm square or n1, okay? So this is for one particular target task, you can achieve this kind of risk. So uh, in some time, this can be much smaller than the, you know, the previous uh, theorem I show, it depends on least single value. Okay. So then we can rewrite, this is for the supervised learning, we can still rewrite the original theorem in this way. So it depends more, uh, more fine grained and not uh, dependency on the target task. 
Okay, so now let's uh, actually develop active learning. We can, so we want to do something better, right? So using active learning, we want to even achieve a better bound than this one. So here's how we do it. So the algorithm uh, is very simple. So let's first look at the case that we know this past relevance. This is definitely a very strong assumption. Usually you don't have such uh, information, but let's first use this information to develop the algorithm and later we'll modify the algorithm to the more uh, practical case. So the only thing we change is here. So remember in the super uh, multi in the previous uh, part one, uh, we sample the number uh, equal number of data from each task. It's a uniform positive something. But here we will sample the number of uh, data from each task according to a uh, proportional to uh, this new star uh, square for each task. Okay. So this is um, you know uh, kind of important sampling. Uh, where the importance depends on this new stuff. And the other are the same instead of, um, uh, you know, as we use the same procedure to learn um, this representation, but just, you know, with different number of data for a different task. And uh, for the target task, uh, it's the same. We just, again, we fix H and we train the last thing that Yeah, the only thing here is just the number of data for each task is different. So here's our result. Um, we can, if we sample, you know, the number of data for each task according to this number, then we have the target task of uh, of this. Okay, so um, here we have this. Uh, the number uh, for the ter first term is different. So now it depends on for the uh, linear predictor. Okay, linear subset learning. We have dk times s star times nu star square or n one t. Okay. So this S star is kind of an uh, approximate uh, sparsity, which runs from one to big T. Okay, so remember this is a bound for the passive um, uh, something. Okay, and uh, you have this S star is always from one to T. So in the in the worst case, okay, S star is T, then uh, this recovers the original uh, passive bound. But in some case. Uh, the S star can be one. So it's uh, much smaller than the worst case, okay? For example, uh, if one source task equals to the target task and others are kind of orthogonal, then in this case, S star uh, is one and new star is one. And then you can have a one over T improvement over the passive something, okay? So basically in the best case, you can save a number of task factor using active learning. So the intuition for this particular example is that suppose you know new star, what you need to do uh, for this case, like there's one source that equals the target task and all others are irrelevant. So for this case, what you should do, okay? Uh, in total, you have N1T data. In the passive something, you sample N1 data from each task. But if you know that there's one task that actually equals to the uh, target task, what you do, you should just use all the data to sample from this particular task, right? That's why you can save an additional uh, one or two factor uh, with this, um, um, with this uh, task relevance information. All right, so this is for the known new star. For the unknown new star, actually it's kind of easy. You just estimate new star iteratively. So here's our algorithm. The main ideas are, you know, with a new, uh, ask me to start with three and you follow a doubling uh, schedule. So this is an algorithm. So at a high level, you know, at each time you just sample according to some estimated um, new star, okay? And times some uh, scheduling factor with two times uh, two to the J. So J is uh, uh, the, the index for the epoch. So every epoch you double the number of samples. And then what you do is that every, every epoch, you sample this number of data, you train the representation, and then you train this linear predictor, and then you estimate um, this new hat and that new star based on your estimated uh, W and uh, WT plus one. Okay, basically every iteration, you do some estimation of W hat, uh, this W star and WT plus one star, and use those to estimate this new. And then you use this estimate new to do sampling for the next apple. And number of data in each apple is, uh, is doubled. Okay. So you can obtain some similar results. In theory, uh, you still have this term, but you have some lower term, which accounts for estimating the new stuff. But it's a lower term, it's smaller than the one t So usually it's much smaller. All right. So that's the main idea. 
Uh, so that's us for the theoretical results. Uh, in the end, let me actually show you some interesting um, experiments we tried. Okay. So here the data set is called AMNIS-C. Uh, C stands for corruption. So there are 16 types of uh, corruptions. So these are the 15 types and the original image is also one type of uh, corruption. Okay. So in total, you have uh, 16 types of uh, corruption for the AMNIS data. So in total, you will have 100 and 60 binary tasks because we have 10 digits and 16 types of corruptions. And each task has uh, 150 sources, okay? Because uh, we just use 10 digits on the form of 15 other types of corruptions. So here we try two kind of uh, representation function. One is linear representation, one is the two-layer convolution neural network. All right, so here's we compare our active learning uh, results with the uh, uh, super or the passive learning uh, result. Okay, so here each row represents one type of uh, corruption, and um, each column represents one particular digit. Remember, in total we have uh, 160 uh, tasks. Okay, and this number shows the improvement over the uniform something or the basic passive something. Okay, so here we fix the number of um, total number of data for both passive and active learning. I want to see if active learning can improve the passive learning. So generally speaking, uh, we have an average improvement of 1.1%, uh, where the baseline error is 8%. So that's uh, kind of significant compared with baseline uh, because you already you only have 8% error and you can still improve 1.1%. And we have policy improvement over the majority of tasks for the linear representation. And here's the um, uh, illustration, uh, the histogram of incorrect prediction. So you can see here uh, a shift to the left, where you know the uh, left means you have less error. Okay. So here's a uh, ADA means our adaptive something or the active learning, where non-ADA means uh, represents the uh, passive something. So this is for linear representation. We also try this uh, nonlinear representation function. Uh, so the improvement is smaller, but you can see here the baseline error is also smaller because you know we use a stronger uh, representation function of uh, convolution neural networks. And generally, you still have uh, improvement over the majority of tasks, even for uh, using a nonlinear representation function. And this is another very interesting uh, finding using active learning. So remember, this is a task relevance, which measures the kind of uh, uh, connection between one source task and one target task, right? So if we plot this learned new star, okay, we can actually see, actually uh, see some very interesting pattern. Okay, so here the target task is uh, whether the class by image is two or not, and is corrupted by a uh, method or uh, one type of corruption called glass blur. You can see here this is a learned uh, task relevance. Okay, so for this target task, you can see here. Uh, so here the lighter the uh, the higher the uh, task relevance, okay? the darker, the smaller the task relevance. You can see here uh, the, the learned uh, task relevance concentrate, uh, have a larger volume on other corruption with digit two. Okay? So this is very intuitive. Like if you want to classify whether image is two or not, you should use the uh, other uh, pre-training task, which also uh, about what, classify whether an uh, image is two or not, right? And this indeed the case, we have learned this relationship um, that the task relevance on the other task that also about classifying the image to two or not is much higher than the uh, task relevance of the other task. So this actually provides some interpretability of uh, the connection between different tasks, okay? So this is for linear. For the ComNet, it's not as obvious as the linear, but you can see here still the you know, digit two's relevance tasks are much higher than the other tasks. But can maybe you know for nonlinear activity, nonlinear representation, there's some more interesting behavior there. There's some other tasks that are also very large. Okay. Um, all right. So in summary, um, for the part two, you know, active learning is very useful for representation learning, and here we give the a formal definition of past relevance and uh, empirically and theoretically we show it can be stronger than passive learning. Also it provides some interpretability. So I think there are a line uh, where, uh, you know, uh, very fruitful future research direction, uh, you know, use our leverage existing active learning techniques for representation learning. It's very, both in theory and practicing is very uh, promising. And uh, here we may need some other definition of past relevance 
also we only study the multitask learning setting and you know for representation learning there are many methods like act, uh, contrastive learning and self supervised learning etc and maybe you can use several of active learning methods for those uh, uh, methodologies and uh, this for some acknowledgement these are my wonderful collaborators uh, thank you i'm happy to take some more questions thank you for um, so Simon, did you hear the question? Basically, uh, it asked about like harmful tasks for, for a target task. So what do you mean? A harmful task for the in the training for a particular target task. Oh, you mean whether there exists some harmful uh, source tasks? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so there can be uh, several source of uh, harms uh, for for the target task. So, if you look at the assumption here, uh, let's see if this one works. Let's look at the uh, supervised learning case. Okay. All uh, right. Uh, so there can be a one kind of a uh, uh, harmful source act is that you know the, this particular source act does not share good representation with the target task. Okay, so that can be harmful in the sense that you may learn something that you may, you know because you are doing a joint optimization in order to you know minimize the risk for this harmful source act, you may find some representation that's actually not good for the other. So that can be a, a harmful source act. For the other, for the diversity, if they share a good common good representation, generally it's you know it's good to add some. Um, I don't think that can be a harmful source task. You know, usually, you you know the more <laughs> source task the better. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. One more question. Yes, go ahead. So it's kind of a minor comment, but um, in the example you had the. Uh, so in the second example, you but you had the, the source task was based on just the tenth digit, but the target task, yeah. yeah. So, um, so the other one. Um, so the, you had it slightly just like this later. Uh, this one. Or the the active learning example. This one. Yeah, this one actually. Yeah. So this is one thing I'm confused about. So here, why the example? Kind of not similar to the previous one since the source test only depends on the tenth digit, so it's not, it's also not really using all of the 50, first sixty digits. Uh, yeah, the source tasks are the same. It's just a target ta target task is different. Okay, so uh, in the bad scenario is that the target task actually uses the uh, entire one hundred digits, uh, but the this but for this okay scenario is that you only use the first still you only use the first 50 digits uh which is already covered in the source task so that's the main difference yeah, but the source test so it's kind of like i feel like it's similar because source test doesn't really need the entirety of the first 50 digits only need the 10th one. Oh wait oh, sorry this is just an example uh one example of the for a source task. so here you know the setting is uh the source has still cover the entire of the first 50 digits. Um, yes, please go ahead. Uh, is there a way to extract what parts of like this subspace is most useful? So like- um... Ah, that's a great question. So I think we can do it with our definition of uh, task relevance, uh, at least in, to some extent. Uh, oh, yeah, here. So, Okay, so remember, uh, you learn um, this representation. Uh, so you can somehow extract which tasks are more relevant, right? And you can look at this task, the source task corresponding subspace, uh, which can be provide some uh, information or interpret interpretation of which subspace is uh, more informative or useful. Because uh, you have a case, you can assign a score for each task. And you can look at the highest scores task, uh, what the subspace or the rotation corresponds to the particular task. So one quick question. So is there like a, um, a, an intuition why you're using L2? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So we are, so first, uh, because we consider regression tasks with L, L quadratic loss, 
Uh, with L2, we can, you know, kind of still get this kind of clean bound uh, with L2. But if you use L1, you may not get this kind of clean bound here. But you're right. Actually, we are trying some other norm right now. And actually, I think uh, maybe in the next couple of uh, months, uh, we'll have a new paper showing using some other norm can achieve better result for, for active learning. Yeah. So yeah, the choice of norm, uh, it, yeah, I think it's pretty open that what kind is, whether there exists a optimal norm for the definition in some sense, uh, but I think that's very interesting. Fantastic. So let's have one last question from Zoom audience. It is asking, in this setting, does the joint optimization of all tasks together interfere with each, each other, basically hinder the learning? Oh, whether it hinders learning. Is this a question you were asking? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, if you, okay, so under the assumption that uh, they share a good representation, then joint optimization uh, generally helps because uh, it forces you to learn that particular good representation. But if, you know, there's some harmful uh, tasks that do not share a good representation with the others, then this joint uh, optimization can be, uh, may not be optimal. Uh, yeah, I think that's a general very good question, whether if there, you don't know whether they share a good representation or not, whether you can change the algorithm or change the optimization procedure to uh, you know, mitigate this harmful effect. All right, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. So let's thank uh, everyone.